welcome to WordPress Accessibility Meetup Beyond WCAG Compliance, Next Steps in Your Website's Commitment to Digital Inclusion. Uh, if you haven't been before, I have a few announcements just to start us off. We have a Facebook group that you can join if you want to connect between meetups. You can find it if you just search WordPress Accessibility on Facebook, or the URL is facebook.com slash groups slash WordPress dot accessibility. This is a great place to ask questions, share what you're working on, get feedback, answer other people's questions. There's a lot of really wonderful people who attend the meetup and are super helpful in the group. So we recommend joining it if you are a Facebook user, or even if you don't use regular Facebook, you can just come to the group and ignore it. all the rest of it. <laughs> uh, Everyone always asks, is this being recorded? Yes, this is being recorded. You can find upcoming events and past recordings in one place if you go to equalizedigital.com slash meetup. That's where the recording will be. It'll take us about two weeks to get corrected transcripts and captions, and then we will post up the recording there. If you want to get notified when the recording is available and other news and event announcements, please join our email list. And you can do that if you go to equalizedigital.com slash focus dash state. We also are releasing episodes as well, meetup recordings as episodes on our podcast because we had a couple of people ask if they could just listen to them. And you can find those at accessibilitycraft.com if you want to listen rather than watch. Uh, we are seeking additional sponsors for the meetup. Unfortunately, the WordPress Foundation has told us that they cannot cover the cost of live captioning for our events or ASL if we're able to, if we want to have that. And so we rely on the generosity of sponsors to help support the those costs for the meetup. If you are interested, please reach out to me and uh, my co-organizer, Paula, who's not currently here. And you can reach us if you just email meetup at equalizedigital.com. We're also looking for speakers. I know we're looking for a topic for February right now at our evening meetup. If you are interested in speaking, please reach out and let us know. So who are we? Um, oh, look, I have an old slide. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, but I am Amber Hines. I am the lead organizer. My company is Equalize Digital. We are a certified B Corp focused on WordPress accessibility. And we make an accessibility checker plugin that scans WordPress websites for problems, sort of like the way Wave works, only in your WordPress dashboard. Um, I do actually think the webinar that I have on this outdated slide that says Thursday, November 16th at 10 a.m. <laughs> If you go to that URL, equalizedigital.com slash webinar, it's a Zoom on demand. So I think you can actually still watch that, even though it's not live. Uh, so sorry that I failed to update my slide. We have one sponsor that I want to thank today, Ivy Cat Web Services. Ivy Cat has been amazing. They have sponsored a lot of our live captions for the daytime meetup. Ivy Cat helps clients and agencies create market, and maintain high-performing WordPress websites and web apps that are fast, easy to use, accessible, and get results. IvyCat offers website care plans, search engine optimization, and accessibility services to help clients grow and succeed without the stress and headaches of doing it alone. Uh, please learn more about them. You can go to IvyCat, I-V-Y-C-A-T dot com. Or if you are on Twitter, we always like to encourage people to tweet a thank you to our sponsors because it helps to encourage them to want to continue sponsoring so they know that people are hearing their little commercials. Uh, so you can tweet thank you to Ivy Cat at Ivy Cat Web on Twitter. The next events that you should know about, I know we are nearing the end of the year, but we are planning, as I mentioned earlier, even into next year, and we have a lot of great talks coming up. So Monday, December 18th at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time, Alex Stein and I will be doing one of our quarterly plug-in accessibility audits where he gets on and he shares 
his screen and his screen reader sounds and we go through. We'll be auditing the Pi Calendar plugin, which is fun because we've never done a plugin with a calendar on it. And if you've never heard the way a screen reader interacts with the calendar, it is definitely worth tuning in for. And then on Thursday, January 4th, we'll be kicking off the new year in the same time slot with Abby Wood talking about writing accessible copy. So if you are a copywriter or you have copywriters in your organization, it is definitely a talk to tune in for. And I put myself on the line here on Monday, January 15th. And that, sorry, I apologize. That should not say 10 a.m. That should say 7 p.m. Central. We're all out of sorts since Paula's not here today. <laughs> Um, I will be presenting on building a low-code accessible WooCommerce website. Um, and why this is especially fun is this is going to be a case study. I am going to build a swag shop with print-on-demand t-shirts and whatnot. And it's going to be accessible. And I have to do it before this meetup so that I can talk to you all about it. <laughs> so uh, if you are interested in WooCommerce accessibility, that will definitely be worth tuning in for Um to see what that process was like. And I am very excited to introduce today's speakers. Let me pop them up here so we can say hello. So Andrew Malice is the CEO and co-founder of Calamuna, a Toronto slash Oakland, California based digital agency that partners with socially impactful institutions, associations, and governments to help them solve today's most pressing problems. And Mike McCaffrey is the senior architect at Calamuna. Whether he's thinking strategically about business requirements, tracking and prioritizing user stories, solving complicated design problems, analyzing metrics, or releasing new features, Mike finds the most straightforward and efficient means to pave the path into the fourth dimension. So welcome both of you. I had the honor of meeting them at uh, WP Campus this year, and I was excited to you know, chat with them quite a bit there and at a jazz club afterwards in New Orleans, which was nice. And then... Uh, we're, I'm excited to hear you all present. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'll let you take over. I will be watching the Q&A. If you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A module. It's a little bit easier for me to track than the chat. Um, and then we will answer most questions at the end of the session. And I do see someone has their hand up. If you want to DM me in the chat, then I can address your question. So let me stop sharing. Great. And that should do it. Yes? yes? Yes. All right. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks, Amber and, and team for animating this community and for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, the title of our talk, as mentioned, is uh, Beyond WCAG, uh, which most of you know stands for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, it's beyond compliance. You know, uh, we're we're here to talk about what it it really takes to build inclusive experiences, and um, what um, how we can commit, you know, to those um, those those goals. Um, my name is Andrew Malice. I'm the CEO of Calamuna. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm a, a six foot tall man with shoulder length, dark hair and a short beard. Although my avatar um, still displays a mustache. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Mike. Yeah, I'm Mike McCaffrey, uh, he, him. Um, as Amber said, I am a senior architect. Um, I am also a you know, large man, uh, six foot three though, slightly taller than Andrew. Um, I'm a white guy. Uh, my picture has glasses and a hat. Um, but if you see me in the video chat, I look more tired because it is 8 a.m. here and I haven't had enough coffee yet. We'll fix that. Um, Calumet is a digital agency and we're focused on working with mission-driven organizations, uh, including nonprofits like the Environmental Defense Fund, American Foundation for the Blind, uh, educational institutions like Stanford and UC Berkeley, and many public um, 
uh, utilities or uh, government institutions, including uh, a lot of transportation in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Calumna Care is about web accessibility, and uh, we believe the internet should be built for everyone, uh, not for fear of legal action, but uh, because it's the right thing to do. Um, without you know, diminishing the negative consequences of non-compliance, we, we really invite um, organizations and individuals to approach web accessibility with humans in mind, and we want to share with you some of what we've learned over the past decade plus of, of doing this work. We have a lot to cover today. We've already uh, went through some introductions. We'll start with some principles and move through uh, different methodologies for site auditing and remediation, which um, will then take us into conversations about uh, design practice and development practices and how we can be more integrated in our approaches uh, from the get-go. We'll speak about uh, governance and uh, you know what talk these days wouldn't uh, be a talk without a section about artificial intelligence. So we'll, we'll touch on that and uh, conclude uh, with some resources available to you to help empower you in your journey and take some questions. Uh, at the end, uh, if not, if not some along the way. Um, but I'd like to, you know, start with some principles. They're always important. Principles are foundational, and uh, inclusion. You know, we we're talking about inclusion. Just to to be sure we're on the on the same page here. Um, you know, inclusion is an it's an organizational effort and practices in which uh, different groups or individuals having different backgrounds are culturally and socially accepted and welcomed and equally treated. And this means that everyone, regardless of race, religion, age, gender, or ability is treated respectfully and equitably. You know, and equi equity is really the key. First, we have to recognize we're not, not everyone is equal in terms of their abilities. And when we can take steps to ensure that everyone is accommodated so they can contribute and participate, um, you know, we're much, uh, we're much better off. And accommodations, you know, in the physical world include uh, curb, curb cuts and wheelchair ramps and auditory indicators at busy street cross crossings, the signals that safe to cross. Um, but, you know, basically it means in being inclusive. Um, it's about uh, thinking how we can accommodate everyone and, and giving the attention and energy required to ensure that people are treated equitably so they feel included in society. And, you know, sometimes those differences, they can be self-evident or they can be inherent, um, such as you know, educational background, training, sector experience, or, or even personality, um, such as you know, um, thinking about introversion or, or extroversion. And inclusion, it's, uh, it's really a sense of belonging. And inclusive cultures, they make people feel respected and valued for who they are as an individual or a, a group. And that's particularly important. Uh, it's important to engage individuals and and um it's been you know evidence has shown that when people feel valued they function at full capacity feel part of an organization's mission and it helps organizations you know uh, succeed and and soar so really um we're focused uh, today on, on speaking about you know digital inclusion which really is about designing applications and online content to enable and encourage self-sufficiency uh, participation and and collaboration uh, ultimately you know I, I believe that as a society we're all richer through the the diversity of perspectives and that inclusivity uh, ensures that we're all you know uh, richer in the experiences that we're we're providing and and that we're engaging in together. Um, compliance, you know, compliance does not guarantee usability. Uh, that 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 is really a core tenant to the what we're talking about today. And organizations tend to focus a lot on conformance, and they, you know, they put strict. So we're a digital agency. We see this all the time. We we get contracts back, and it's great to see that organizations are more and more attuned to. Um, becoming accessible. Um, but they they try to sometimes put strict requirements and contracts that would like put agencies in breach if they don't make a website accessible. But you know sometimes um, not not to knock you know the importance of conformance, but if we focus too much on test scores, um, that can risk descoping usability. And the reality is that you know no agency can really guarantee compliance. There, 
we work in open source and software ecosystems sometimes inadvertently can introduce issues on updates uh, and content editors, you know, they can miss the mark too. Um, alt text, you know, it might be there, but, but really is it descriptive and, you know, there's a button, but, you know, does the form submit and that usability is really core to the experience that we're trying to create. And um, we'll, we'll speak a little bit more about, uh, you know, why that's, that's super important. You know, we've, previously demonstrated in presentations with our friends at the American Foundation for the Blind how the vaccinefinder.org website was at one time WCAG compliant according to automated testing tools, but uh, failed keyboard navigation and screen reader testing. And I'll, I'll give a link to that powerful uh, demonstration at the end of this presentation uh, for you. Um, but, you know, really, we shouldn't let the fear of a lawsuit hold us back from focusing on really what really matters. And that's that's helping people achieve their goals. Um, what's displaying here currently is an animated uh, GIF that has a pink circle representing accessibility issues, a blue circle representing user goals that come together while an arrow points at the overlap like a Venn diagram to indic indicate, you know, what matters most. Um, I'd like to pass it off uh, to Mike at this point to talk a little bit more about uh, site auditing and remediation. All right. Okay, hopefully that is a seamless transition. Uh, hi, yeah, this is Mike. I'm going to be talking about uh, site auditing and remediation. Um, most web projects aren't starting from a blank slate. Um, I'm guessing you have an existing website if you're looking at a uh, a presentation about next steps. And uh, even if, if websites are built from the ground up to be accessible, uh, we found that best practices tend to evolve over time. So even things that we built with the best intentions and best of knowledge, um, we find that they there's better ways to do it in the future. So it's really useful to regularly review all websites in order to find opportunities to improve usability and accessibility. So our methods for evaluating websites for accessibility tend to fall under three big categories. Uh, the first is automated scanning. The second is user testing. And the third is usability or heuristic analysis. I will explain what that is soon. Um, let's talk about automated scanning first, uh, since that's usually the first thing that people think about when they start to work on the accessibility of their websites. Uh, as you probably know, being web professionals, that there are plenty of browser extensions uh, that, are, that are some of the easiest ways to determine how accessible your website is, and most of them are free. Um, there's several popular browser extensions like Wave and Axe Dev tools that are great for finding issues with pages on your site. You can visit any page and, and have them quickly generate a list of things that you need to, to fix. They're, they're really great for identifying issues that appear on every part, every favorite page on your site, since you can look at just one page and identify issues with the header and menu and um, footer. Uh, the downside of the, the browser scanning is that they might find too many issues. I know everyone's used uh, accessible scanning tools and found a whole bunch of items, like hundreds and hundreds of items, and a lot of them are not terribly important. Uh, they find things that might be technically incorrect, but perhaps don't impact any actual users. Like, you know, my favorite example is uh, we use visually hidden text that uses some CSS to hide text, you know, off the side of the screen inside of a little pixel. And so, but still leaves it available for screen readers and scanning tools love to talk about the color contrast of the visually hidden text. So it's, it's one thing that we always have to address if we want to not have those errors in scanning tools. Uh, the second type of automated testing is site-wide crawling tools. Um, those run the same sort of tests, but on many or all pages of your site. Uh, because site crawling can be so resource intensive, uh, most of the site-wide scanning tools aren't free, and they actually tend to be so expensive that they can strain your organization's budget. Um, these tools are really helpful for catching content issues on your site since they scan every page. Uh, and can be set up to do so routinely. 
They're also valuable for content governance. They can identify when regressions happen after things have been fixed, but then they break again. Um, and they also help demonstrate improvement over time. Most of the tools have a nice helpful score uh, to show where you are in terms of accessibility and make you feel good when you fix issues and you see the score go up. Uh, we do have some cautions about uh, using accessibility scanning tools. Uh, a big one is that no single tool will actually find all the issues on your site. All the tools tend to run the test slightly different and seem to flag different issues. So you shouldn't really rely on any one of them. Um, and even then only like 30 to 60%, depending on different people's uh, measurements of, of accessibility um, criteria can actually be tested automatically. And all the rest of them need to have time sensitive, uh, time intensive checklists that you need to go through. Um, and even then it, it takes a lot of effort to make all of the issues that automated tools find actually go away. You end up spending a lot of time addressing very tiny little things in order to like clear your dashboard. And even after all that, uh, and you've reached the compliance of uh, like total compliance based on the accessibility tools that doesn't really ensure the usability of your site at all. Um, and last, I, I mentioned the score that, that most tools provide. Uh, the scores are usually just some proprietary algorithm that compares your site against others. And it doesn't actually represent the usability or user experience of your users. So the, se the second group of uh, site auditing practices we're gonna talk about is user testing. Um, user testing is a practice that engages people, not robots, and tries to accomplish tasks. They try to accomplish tests on your website and report back on their experience. Just an overview of the um, sort of a user testing process. Uh, the first thing that we find most important is to determine high priority user stories on user journeys. User testing is time consuming um, and fairly expensive. Uh, so you really wanna focus on what the most important things are to your users. Uh, the, second, the second thing we, we stress is have real life people try to accomplish those tasks. Uh, you don't want just the project team or highly technical users evaluating the accessibility of your site. You want to try to get an outside perspective on the things that you take for granted the, the third item we stress is find users who use accessibility tools that require accessible features on a regular basis. Uh, not only are they familiar with the tools and are able to conduct the tests, uh, but they also know how your implementation might be different from common design patterns and how users expect to see things. And the, the final thing is, is you really want to get feedback, detailed feedback on how easy it is or difficult to achieve a goal. Um, that really helps you prioritize uh, your issues and how to fix them. And the most important thing I think is to find any roadblocks that keep some of your users from accomplishing important tasks on your site. Uh, experienced testers who, who could provide feedback uh, using accessibility tools uh, can be hard to find. Uh, luckily, there's some companies who provide user testing services. For example, we've recently partnered with UsableNet uh, to evaluate several sites. They've been doing a great job finding users who rely on different sets of tools to, and to evaluate the different sites and provide some very informative feedback. Um, the screenshot on the screen is a overview showing the overall level of success users found when we conducted a five user journey test on one of the sites. Um, for those who can't see, it has a completed and non-completed showing most of the tasks can be completed by four users, but one of the tasks could not be completed by one user. Um, now on screen, this is an example of a user journey for a project we recently worked on. Uh, for this client, having people reach the how to apply page and following instructions on their application process was one of the most important tasks that they could do. So we had them test that. Um, for your site, obviously, the, the highest priority item would be different. Uh, you might have people enroll in a course or donate or pay for something or fill out a contact form. Um, 
looking at the testing instructions, it helps to provide a little bit of background on where users are coming from so that testers can put themselves in the shoes of the, of the users that they want to test. Um, you know, the instructions say, you'll spend some time on the website learning all facts about the company. Now you wish to find out how to apply for yourself and your friends. Um, visit the How to Apply page where you can find all the info. Uh, and then it also has clear success criteria. Task is considered complete once users review pages related to the procedures and checklist. Um, these user testing tends to, to have a lot of feedback. Uh, for this most recent process project, we tested five user journeys and they generated a 61 page report. Uh, that means it's really good to have a user testing partner who helps you prioritize the feedback. Uh, in this case, UsableNet was able to flag some very high priority recommendations uh, that had the biggest impact on um, users, actual users of the site. Um, not everyone can afford to hire someone to, to conduct or participate in user testing. Um, some organizations might try to offload accessibility testing onto their users. Um, that's really not a good thing. Uh, you don't want to rely on your regular users to identify or suggest fixes for accessibility issues, uh, since it's probably easier for them to decide to just not be your users. Um, it also, also adds additional burden on users who are already having trouble using your site uh, to have them go through additional steps in order to contact you about fixing things. Um, uh, the one sort of exception um, to having users help with things are mission-driven organizations. Mission-driven nonprofits can usually ask for volunteers who support the goals of the organization and want to help in order to help review for accessibility. But for the most part, if you're conducting user testing, it's really great to compensate testers. Next. All right. Um, the third group, so the third practice that we use to identify uh, usability and accessibility issues is to conduct a, a usability analysis, uh, specifically a heuristic analysis. If you think about accessibility in terms of usability, you get access to a whole toolbox of practices that have been pretty common in the user experience community for, for years that help you evaluate the usability of software and websites. Uh, this quote on the screen is from Jacob Nielsen, who came up with the idea of heuristic analysis. Uh, and it says, heuristic evaluation involves having a small set of expert evaluators examine the interface and judges compliance with recognized usability principles, AKA the heuristics. Um, I mean, specifically the idea is to leverage expert knowledge instead of blindly following checklists or, or recommendations of, of automated tools. Heuristic analysis at Calamuna starts with a standard worksheet that we copy for each client. It has categories uh, with a bunch of items under each of heuristics to evaluate. Uh, the slide shows one example, uh, how each item involves the title or name of the heuristic followed by a paragraph with reminders of what to review. In this example, the, the item is contrast and text size. The contrast and size allows text to be read clearly. And then the paragraph says, review common pages to find different text styles and foreground background color combinations. Ensure there's enough contrast between foreground and background colors. Identify small text that is not legible. Um, where contrast is even more important, hover over links and buttons, see if those styles provide enough contrast. Uh, note that these reminders aren't a checklist. It's just this paragraph is there to jog the memories of people about things that they need to test and also help um, you know, the different uh, evaluators know where to put different feedback. Um, you know, in this process, we have several designers and developers go through the site, uh, viewing through the lens of each one of these heuristics, and they note both the positive findings and the issues that they discover. Um, Manually going through the site, having several people manually go th through the site is is in some ways less thorough than automated testing, since obviously it doesn't review everything and look at all the code, uh, but it really is faster and broader and can cover more pages and features efficiently. Um, the, pro the process does require uh, intuition and 
and experience just identifying common issues that people make uh, when building websites. Um, the broad categories that we look at when we're doing a heuristic analysis. Um, the first is visual perception, like that contrast example. Uh, navigation on the site through mouse, keyboard, mobile, screen reader, and voice control. Um, robustness, which is something that accessibility uh, audits tend to usually miss, and that's basically what happens if JavaScript doesn't run or some resource on the page is not available and whether the site is still um, navigatable and comprehensible. And then uh, cognitive considerations, which is basically looking at both content comprehension, content comprehension, which is which is a pretty common thing, but also ease of wayfinding and how easy it is to for users to understand how to get through the site and where they are at any one time. Um, if you want to conduct your own heuristic analysis, um, there there are pros and cons. Uh, the pros is that it's very efficient. It's actually, we found the most efficient use of people's budgets is to have a, you know, um, several experienced developers and designers review the site and find the glaring accessibility issues uh, rather than trying to, to run through an automated test that delivers hundreds of things at the same, you know, level of priority. Um, you know, the heuristic analysis is focused on usability. Like, you're trying to use the site, just like with user testing, and discovering usability issues rather than strict compliance issues. Um, you can use automated tools. Like when we're doing heuristic analysis, we do use automated tools to review the site and just you know see if they find anything, usually browser-based tools. Uh, but it doesn't really depend on any one tool. Uh, the cons of heuristic analysis is that it requires expert knowledge. You need to have someone who actually knows what accessibility uh, entails for websites. Uh, it requires multiple reviewers to catch most of the issues. Uh, no single reviewer. If you have one person look at a site and determine the accessibility, they're going to miss some pretty obvious things. Uh, so we do try to have at least two to four people review the website in this heuristic analysis form, and then we compile all the results into one. Um, I know that there's been some, some in the in the UX world, there's been some tests about about reviewers, and they found that four reviewers is the ideal, and then after that, uh, it tends to have diminishing returns. But you need at least two to four reviewers in order to to catch the majority of the issues. Um, it isn't comprehensive, like it isn't like um, the automated tools that review every item on your site and make sure that everything. Um, so it's less focused on legal compliance uh, and more focused on usability. Um, not every organization can afford to do a hu full heuristic analysis. Uh, you might not have experts on hand or the budget to hire them, uh, but that doesn't mean you, you can't try to do some of it yourself. Um, you know, we encourage everyone to try to use accessibility tools. Um, it's, it's really easy to just tab through your site using a keyboard. Um, you can look to make sure that there are focus states on all of the links and buttons, and there are no keyboard traps. Um, try a screen reader. Um, we use NVDA on Windows and VoiceOver on Apple products. Um, you know, it can be intimidating when your computer just starts yelling things on your screen at you. Um, but if you, you know, quickly research what the controls are, you can navigate through pages. Um, you might not be able to find every issue if you're not an expert in using uh, accessibility tools, but you can definitely find some very obvious problems. I want to emphasize the importance of keyboard navigation. A lot of the yeah. uh, tools that are uh, used in technologies, assistive technologies, um, have as their foundation the same kinds of underpinnings that are um, inherent in keyboards. And if um, a site is navigable via keyboard, um, there's a very uh, very, very high probability that'll be navigable across a broad range of assistive devices. So really um, do start with the keyboard if you can. All right, so we talked about identifying accessible issues and now we need to figure out what to do with them. Uh, this slide says prioritization and remediation. Uh, why is prioritization important? Um, well, there's there's Every project has limited time and resources, and you really can't fix everything. Um, 
you know, there's there's no end to the accessibility issues that you can find on a site if you keep looking. There's there's always another one to uncover. Uh, they get they get usually get increasingly small, but but it's it's basically endless. There's always improvements you can make to every you know pattern and component to make it more accessible. Um, it's really important to to identify major roadblocks for some users that might keep them from accomplishing things at all. And some of the user journeys on your site might be used more frequently by users or might be more important than others. And there might also be some quick wins where, where small amounts of work can really yield large results. Um, when we're prioritizing uh, accessibility issues with our clients, uh, the screen here shows we, we, we just usually throw all the issues we find into a Google Sheet uh, and categorize them by issue type uh, along with an estimate of the amount of work it needs. And a the client helps set a priority based on user benefits and also flag quick, quick wins. And basically that lets us quickly sort all the usability issues by uh, these various metrics. Um, when working with clients, we try not to overload them with, uh, with more technical things like the actual WCAG uh, success criteria. Uh, we're really trying to educate and empower the site owners and, and get them to focus on the outcomes for their users. Um, just some, some common high priority issues uh, that we find that lots of sites have and, and should really address as, as quickly as possible. Um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, you know, uh, keyboard is one of the highest ones and making sure that uh, the focus has visible states and all the links and buttons and that there are no traps where you you know, tab through part of the page and then get stuck and can't get out. Uh, site navigation, you know, honestly, when doing, you know, themes and front end development, it feels like, you know, working on the site navigation with the uh, menus and drop downs and links and uh, mobile navigation is like at least half the work. Um, one thing that organizations or one thing that web developers, one, one thing that websites tend to get wrong is that they think of the mobile navigation as something that is just used on mobile devices that, that use touch. Um, but really when you think about it, the mobile navigation is also for, for any device that has a really small screen, a really small window. Um, so keyboard navigation really needs to work on those as well. Um, Lots of sites miss basic things like having HTML regions for screen reader users. And it's a really a quick win just to go in there and, and throw like header, main and footer regions along with nav regions and sections uh, so that screen readers can navigate between them when they're looking for it. Um, and, and a really big one, and it's it's really hard to, 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 to drill this into some you know, content editors, it's really important to have good heading structure inside of your content. Uh, you really need to follow the hierarchy of H1, H2, H3, H4, uh, just so that screen reader users can tell what contents and what section be able to navigate the page. Uh, since, since heading navigation is one of the primary ways of screen reader users, screen reader users uh, navigate through your website. Uh, another big one is pop-ups and banners. Uh, especially now that we have all the cookie banners and email pop-ups. Uh, they aren't always navigatable by keyboard users. Sometimes they have to tab through the entire page to get to that banner at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and screen reader users, they might not realize that there's been a pop-up if it's not announced properly and might wonder why they're stuck in some you know, email sign-up form rather than the actual page you're trying to look at. And then obviously the perennial issue of people putting text in images, which is not good because even if you, you know, include alt text that includes the text that you have in the image, there's usually a better way to present that to users. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of when to fix things on your site, um, when we're doing our um, accessibility review and remediation process, we tend to do our usability and heuristic analysis and automated scanning first uh, together. And then we try to fix most of the issues there. Um, followed by, and then last we do the user testing. Uh, since user testing is so in time intensive and requires people to manually write down all the problems that they see with the site, uh, you don't wanna waste their time or your time with them documenting issues that you already know exist. So if you're gonna do user testing, it usually pays to do a round of um, 
you know, automated scanning usability test or internal usability testing first and to resolve those issues so you don't, uh, you know, revisit the same thing again and again. And this is, uh, this is you, Andrew, now. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Now, um, you know, what if you are building a new website from scratch? It does happen. It happens every day. Um, how should you approach accessibility? Um, this uh, diagram describes the different phases of our client projects and may reflect uh, many similar types of website uh, project experiences. Um, you know, incorporating accessibility considerations um, into your process ideally starts at the very beginning. Uh, this works best for new projects like site redesigns, but it can also work for new features. So during a discovery in which we're trying to derive insights like the who, the why, the what, um, and really the, the purpose of what we're trying to achieve, um, we want to define our user types and their goals. And this is a super important. It sets the stage for the entire project. It's really critical to incorporate user goals that identify accessibility concerns. For example, we might have a user type or persona that represents people with disabilities with specific goals that turn into user stories, like navigate the site using a keyboard. And during the design phase, uh, which is you know an iterative uh, process, um, it, it, this also includes a content strategy and often content production. We find that uh, incorporating those concerns, um, where we incorporate those concerns we previously identified. For example, content can be structured semantically while it's still in Word or Google Docs before the site is getting uh, architected. And uh, wireframes can take into account things like labels, menu structure, wayfinding, and important interactive elements. And uh, once we get the visual design, we look at things like color contrast, UI elements, uh, like inline links, focus states, and consider progressive enhancement techniques for any motion, including animation and transitions. And then when we're prototyping components, uh, we have another opportunity to test our designs, whether it's a low fidelity clickable wireframe or a fully responsive HTML and CSS prototype uh, we can test with real users to flag potential issues before building them into the final product. And uh, we do really like the in-browser testing because it uses the native medium of the web, which allows for the use of uh, those assistive technologies and, and the ability to get um, you know, really accurate feedback, particularly for navigation where many of the accessibility issues um, can be found. Now, at the end of the pro the end of the project is is not the time to start thinking about accessibility. Um, thinking about like if you're building a a skyscraper, right, and and you wanted to like put an elevator in it, um, thinking about adding that at the end is is pretty hard, right? You want to you want to think about your accommodations um, and your accessibility goals much earlier and and build them in from the start. It's also really useful if everyone on the team, including your you know, content producers, your designers, your developers, your project managers, have a basic knowledge of accessibility concerns. Um, and you know, if not, then at least you know one person should really be knowledgeable on the team to help guide people through this process. Uh, design design follows certain principles as well. We want to make sure that we are designing with usability in mind from the start. Um, it's useful if you are targeting a certain level of compliance or a, a general set of, um, you know, ideal outcomes uh, to to identify a, an accessibility target like WCAG AA is, is most often what we see um, used. Uh, and of course, you know, higher when possible. Um, documenting and validating design choices along the way, very important graceful degradation, progressive enhancement principles, and how those um, uh, those are approached. And uh, having strategies for motion reduction from the start, uh, also really, really key. You don't want to like build a whole thing and then figure out how to make it accessible later. Really think about those things from the get-go. Um, 
Uh, it's an example of how uh, design can be um, approach, uh, approaching uh, accessibility early on. We often inherit like color um, charts, uh, color uh, style guides and uh, less so now, but still um, some colors are not uh, accessible on their own. And so we need to adjust those. But even if those colors do become accessible on their own, it's not a given that in combination at all font sizes, they will be legible. And uh, so we put together this chart that shows um, the, the what combinations at what font sizes pass different criteria and, and what fail. And this allows for a, a general set of guidelines from the beginning in how uh, designs are being approached. Certainly you can test for these things uh, in the browser later, but um, understanding you know, foundationally how, how to approach uh, design is, is very important. Um, we also wanna design with uh, developer needs in mind. That means um, uh, designers need to think about you know, what the hover and active states are gonna look like and uh, how uh, keyboard and, and read screen reader focus order is going to manifest. Um, thinking about how layouts are going to move across different screen sizes, it may not be obvious. And leaving that uh, for developers to improvise um, could be very impactful. If you have a sidebar, it may drop below, but uh, you know where that renders in the document object model, the order of uh, how the screen reader is going to approach things should be defined earlier in the, the design stage uh, as well. Uh, as Mike mentioned, clear heading levels, making sure that our sections and menus uh, all have headings. Some of them can be visually hidden, um, but we, we want to identify these, these landmarks and uh, consider, you know, uh, in the design process, what alt text is going to be needed for any iconography that is used as well. I'm not sort of leaving that till later. Um, make sure we're defining all those uh, common HTML um, elements. Um, from a development perspective, I don't know, Mike, if you want to speak to this a little bit. It's more your your backyard. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is just sort of a random assortment of of development principles uh, that we've put together. A uh, big one is just when you're writing HTML, try to use HTML5 elements rather than relying too much on ARIA attributes. Um, ARIA, ARIA, in my view, sort of is a Band-Aid or duct tape on on you know your 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 code to try to make things accessible when there's lots of HTML5 um, native things that are automatically accessible. Uh, we tend to be using leveraging the details element a lot for a lot of functionality just because it works without JavaScript and hides and shows content very well. It behaves like a button. Um, as Andrew said, we want to pay extra attention to navigation and page structure, uh, just so people can obviously navigate the site. Um, you know. And we'll get to this in questions and answers because there's a lot of AI things. But you know, computers are not great at ensuring accessibility. Um, you know, overlays in AI tend to, well, just overlays tend to tend to not work at making sites more accessible. They just tend to obfuscate things. Um, we encourage people to not build things from scratch whenever possible, and that's where using open source software like Drupal and WordPress uh, really helps because accessibility is baked into them. Um, and the other big thing is, is when you're using custom frameworks, especially things like JavaScript slideshows and stuff, don't trust them to be accessible. Even if they say they're accessible, they're, they're often not accessible. Uh, we've, we've had terrible times finding an accessible slideshow or accessible widgets uh, just because they all seem to miss uh, some very, very basic functionality like labeling the next and previous buttons. Um, so any any recommendations on on accessible slideshows are always always welcome. Yeah, we brought some uh, accessibility improvements to Bootstrap back in the day. So when we do find those those uh, issues, it's important to contribute them back uh, to the community so all all can benefit. You want me to do this one as well? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not a, a WordPress expert. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, I'm more of a Drupal person. Um, when I'm building Drupal sites, I want to make sure that there are in the content editing experience, it's really easy to add separate sections to help ensure proper heading structure and have you wrap each section in H2 uh, where it requires that a title be set. So at least screen readers have like, you know, H2 levels to go through the page. I'm not sure if there's a easy way to require that in WordPress as well. Uh, one thing I also do is um, content editors and, and, and site owners tend to want to omit headings in some parts of their site because visually it's very clear in what the thing is. If there's a calendar, you know, it's like upcoming events, but screen readers, screen reader users don't have that context. So if you're going to have a way for users to, or content editors to admit headings, uh, sometimes it's better to just require headings, but allow them a checkbox or something to visually hide the headings. Um, we also tend to restrict any WYSIWYGs to like H3 and below, so that under one, each of the H2 setting, H2 headings, uh, they can only put H3s and below. It doesn't ensure that they follow H3, H4, H5, but it, it at least helps, again, make sure that there's H2 levels to navigate through the page. Um, we you know, have them insert images via media library whenever possible, rather than just pasting images in individually, uh, just so you can ensure that there is, is, is common alt text and, and make alt text uh, required. When, when adding images to the page. All right. Well, you know, how, how do we, how do you make all this happen or keep it from falling apart? Um, governance is really key. Governance is a system of rules, agreements, and conditions that we set to ensure success. And uh, governance characteristics are dependent uh, often on your organizational size. You know, the way that we govern countries, cities, and uh, states, uh, provinces um, are are very different, and so too are how org organizations are put together. Uh, but one thing uh, that I would um, just really emphasize is that it we always re require a champion for accessibility to be successful within an organization. Uh, anyone that's worked in perhaps a corporate setting or an office building uh, may may know there's there's usually a, a fire marshal who's designated. Uh, maybe they have like that little like fireman's hat on their desk and you run the fire drill and they're kind of, you know, the the, the champion of these safety efforts. And so too uh, is an accessibility champion required internally. You also need um, buy-in from the top. That's that's really key. Uh, at the very top of the organization, it's very important for, for someone to affirm uh, commitment to accessibility. And if you don't have that, uh, and you do have an internal champion, it's it's really uh, worth spending the time and energy uh, to educate and uh, create you know pathways to knowledge uh, that will allow uh, leadership to get behind these issues. Um, those pathways to knowledge uh, are important as well to avoid silos and empower everyone in understanding the goals and outcomes uh, that are being sought uh, to build empathy for uh, users and motivate people to um, speak to them. Uh, it, the edu education can also reinforce um, you know, peer support and the growth of a practice. And uh, everyone likes to you know, feel a part of something larger. And as um, we're getting you know, better, knowing that others care about our success is really uh, valuable. Um, all of this intent is, you know, it needs to be reinforced. The culture needs to be reinforced through policy and having, you know, words and, and writing. Uh, that's that's really, uh, really key. Um, content governance processes as well need to be uh, followed in order to enshrine accessibility into those practices. So a few tips in, uh, in your content governance strategy, um, you know, Really making accessible content means um, having a wide range of people being able to use it, including people with physical and cognitive disabilities from you know, reading disorders, attention deficit disorder, memory disorders, and um, accessibility as well. I mean, it can also be situational, like like in a crisis or, or you know, someone's just in a library, they can't listen to sound. So uh, that's, that's really, really key. So when you're writing, emphasize plain language. Uh, tools like Hemingway can help you visualize this. Uh, looking at Fleisch Kincaid, which is a, an algorithm um, uh, for the grade reading level of your content uh, can be really valuable. 
And uh, if you are able to hit an eighth grade reading level, that reaches about 80% of Americans. Um, and that's that's super important. Again, it takes that that buy-in from the top and those policies to reinforce this. You know, I was talking to someone in government and they'd written a whole bunch of stuff and it came back to their manager and they were like, you have to rewrite this. It's not governmenty enough, you know? They're deliberately trying to make it the language less accessible. And that's just, you know, uh, a hard a hard thing uh, to co to combat in like a, a reporting structure unless you have some of these foundational principles to draw upon. Uh, write for inclusivity. Uh, and that includes, you know, that all of, these uh, um, and that includes you know inclusivity of of gender and um, uh, all kinds of broader principles as well. Um, institute gatekeeping for posting inaccessible PDFs. Like you might have some bad stuff up there, but just like stop it today. Like don't don't allow PDFs to go up on your site if they aren't accessible, and uh, and try to fix what you can. Uh, take down what's unnecessary. Um, have uh, guides and documentation for crafting meaningful alt text and more, deploy some automated monitoring solutions that can report on changes if it's possible, uh, that will allow you to catch things before others experience them, and uh, you know invest in, in manual uh, versus automated translation whenever possible. Uh, it introduces more cultural sensitivity. Uh, AI has improved vastly when it comes to uh, translation. Um, but still, there's a lot that it it misses. And speaking of artificial intelligence, uh, I'd like to uh, bring a little bit more, you know, fo focus to what's been emerging here. But with, um, you know, particularly when it comes to alt text, we had much ambition many years ago that we'd be able to use uh, AI to, um, you know, help large institutions that had a plethora of images that were, uh, you know, un unalted, and um, so we did some experiments, you know, three, four years ago, found some deficiencies. And, um, you know, it's because, you know, AI, it, it lacks emotion. It's missing context. And more and more tools are introducing automated alt text now. Uh, uh, document uh, uh, um, digital asset management systems, um, CMSs. Uh, Microsoft Word now has uh, this stuff baked in, and sometimes it tries to push it on you. Um, you know there are other opportunities here. Uh, we're we're doing some cool stuff with uh, with AI. I'll, I'll, but uh, I wanted to just uh, focus a little bit on a few examples of where alt text can can fail uh, with with the robots. Um, so in this photograph, uh, the alt text that a human had uh, written says uh, a fashionable person with styled white hair, wearing bright makeup and dark blue clothing, walks in front of a brick building. And evocative, uh, fortunate, and uh, the AI says a person in a garment, which represents you know virtually uh, everyone you know on a website. Well, not some websites, but you know the websites that we work on. And uh, it, fortunately, the AI didn't assume anything about a person's gender, which is positive. But it's just so bland uh, that it it really doesn't describe anything. Um, perhaps you may be. You know, there are a lot of optical illusions, that picture of like, is it a face? Is it a, a rabbit? Here's a similar example. The human uh, has described this image as large pink flowers with green leaves and thorny stems digitally manipulated into a side profile of a statue against a black background. Uh, the AI sees a close up of a flower. So the, all that context is is missing that, that, that nuance. Uh, if you saw the silhouette, you know, AI didn't. Um, in this photograph, human alt text says, Steve Jobs at Mac World 2008, unveiling the new MacBook Air. And uh, the AI thinks it's a man in front of a crowd. Again, very generic. Now AI is evolving and the right model could certainly leverage facial recognition, uh, perhaps you know, grow in this context. Um, but today, you know, your mileage may vary. And one last example, uh, this one drawn from uh, Duke University Libraries. Uh, this is a rare 18th century Ethiopic scroll uh, presented partially unfurled from its archival storage. Uh, but Microsoft Word and all its uh, you know, goodwill has identified this as a roll of toilet paper. Um, you know, I, I do not think that's accurate. And so um, you know, the, the university has uh, decided to disable uh, this feature more permanently. And that isn't to say there isn't opportunity here. You know, don't 
don't get me wrong. Um, but personally, um, like I would like to know as a user what's been generated and what hasn't. Uh, things are moving so quickly that uh, you know everything gets flattened. Once we use AI to generate alt text, it it gets put into code, and we can't really tell you know what's human, what's generated. Um, I feel like we need some more uh, declarative features on our websites to be able to say, hey, you know, this was generated. And it might give an opportunity for another plugin to regenerate something using a newer technology. But we're anchoring a lot of these solutions as we're hungry to fix things, perhaps in a way that might, you know, two years from now, um, be like a real, a real setback. So again, not to dissuade people from exploring these technologies, but do so mindfully, look at the real outcomes and move beyond compliance uh, to think about usability. Uh, in conclusion, we'll get to some of the questions here. Um, you know, incorporate accessibility throughout your redesign process. It's very important. Um, don't just wait till the end. And uh, remember that no one testing method is better than another. Multiple are needed uh, in combination um, to get you know, as, as broad and efficient uh, coverage as possible. Uh, every automated test is a little bit different, but all of them are verbose. And uh, an antidote to that can be heuristic analysis, which helps reveal usability-focused issues. Um, user testing, you know, it's ideal with specialized organizations. And, uh, and again, you know, when many issues have already been uh, addressed. Uh, prioritize and address accessibility issues once they're found. You know, don't just kind of let them sit there, engage... Um, uh, actively in that. Uh, content governance is foundational and uh, and once again, you know, AI, it can't, can't solve all your problems, at least not yet. Uh, we'd like to share some resources available with uh, to you. Uh, this is a, a link uh, at a bit, a bit.ly link uh, at slash a11y-vfd of a demonstration. It's a nine minute long video on YouTube that is captioned of the vaccinefinder.org website at a point in time. They have since improved the usability and accessibility of this website, uh, but it demonstrates really clearly how a keep uh, a mouse style navigation to site works after where keyboard traps exist and last how a screen reader moves through and has difficulty in some areas that might be unexpected uh, to, to you. And uh, all along, you know, the automated tools report very little wrong with this website. And this can be a very compelling demonstration uh, for uh, for you to to show if you're looking for that buy-in. How uh, you know someone who might be higher up who just thinks, well, we just need to make everything pass the tests, right? That's my account level of accountability. And and once uh, they can build empathy for that user experience, um, then you know we can move beyond uh, that compliance. Uh, piece. Uh, we've put together a little uh, PDF, uh, which um, you can get at uh, hello.calamunita.com slash A11Y dash TIPS. Uh, it's a little slow to load. It was built in some like open source stuff that's uh, getting a little long in the tooth. So please be patient if you're uh, looking to download it. But it, in this PDF, it, it compiles uh, a number of resources and tools uh, screen reader tools, plugins, uh, contrast testing tools, a cornucopia of uh, various uh, methodologies that you can leverage as well for making PDFs accessible. Um, it's it's a it's a useful uh, resource. We hope at least. Uh, and last, uh, if you visit uh, our website at uh, kalamuna.com and you are design oriented or even design curious, we recently published a very comprehensive uh, article on our blog um, that lists a number of free plugins for Figma, which is a, uh, a wonderful collaborative design tool that we uh, and many other organizations leverage. Um, so free Figma plugins for accessibility design. This was authored by our director of design and user experience, Crispin Bailey and um, a senior UX UI designer, Eugene Park. Uh, I wanna thank everyone uh, for um, your thoughtfulness and these um, uh, accessibility in our accessibility journey. And um, we'll um, bring it over to, um, I guess, the the questions at this point, which well, are... Uh, yeah. can, I, can, I, can I start while you review the questions, Andrew, since you've been, yeah. you've been talking? Yeah. Okay. 
We have we have one Definitely. question in the chat that I want to get to first, and then we can go through the, the question and answer Great. in the interface. Uh, Maureen asked, uh, can Mike explain again the contrast issues that arrive in Wave for icons, i.e. Facebook, that tell me there's a contrast issue I cannot find? Um, we have basically started to avoid using, I guess, I guess the other thing. Um, yeah, we've we've basically started to, well, at least personally, started to avoid using images anywhere but in the content. Uh, anything like icons, we tend to use uh, SVGs for, and then put visually hidden text next to it. Um, that tends to avoid some issues around alt text. So we encourage that. Um, I'm not sure why your you know, specific thing is flagging the, the, the color contrast, but again, there usually is, um, and this is where automated tools are kind of annoying, is that they would flag something as like an icon is not having enough contrast, even though they obviously do. Um, the I other, think, the you other, know, yeah. one thing that I've noticed sometimes is some automated tools, they check what's in the style sheet, but they don't mm -hmm. always know what's actually, like if you have multiple instances, mm -hmm. it might be like, well, the first one was white, you know, white on light gray, and that would fail. It was actually overwritten by another instance of CSS lower, but it's gonna flag the first one, which you can't see just because it happens to exist in the style sheet because it doesn't know <laughs> which styles are actually being output on the page. The I've seen that with mm -hmm. some tools. Yeah. Um, so that might be why she can't see it, uh, even though it's flagging it in a not in wave. Uh, yeah. Um, another so another question that's kind of very very detailed is is Mark asked about uh, the rec recommendation for using the details element uh, specifically around the the recommendation that you shouldn't use it because headings aren't navigable in it on some tools. Um, that's pretty much been resolved in that uh, details, people are saying not to use details elements because if you put a heading like an H2 inside the summary tag, uh, some tools would not go to it if you're navigating by heading. And that's been increasingly less of an issue over time. And most tools now will go to the heading if it's in a summary. So I would say that reason for not using detail elements are, um, are not there. In fact, details elements have just gotten better and better. And now browsers are actually, will open details elements automatically if you're finding text within a page. And that if, if your user is like searching for text in a page and it's inside a details element, the browser will just open it and jump down to it. Whereas if you have any sort of manually uh, activated uh, disclosure element, uh, the, the find and page won't work for it. So it's like, I see the the advantage of the details element over other disclosure elements are, are Disclosure patterns, it's just it's it's clear now. Just just use details. <laughs> Great. Uh here I can run through some of the sure. questions. There were a few related to AI, and I think maybe it makes sense to start there since that's sort of where you ended, and then we'll go back through. Um so Marsha had asked, do you think AI will increase the percent of issues found? Uh I'm thinking on like automated testing. Will it as it gets smarter, will it find more problems in automated testing, do you think? Sure. But, you know, what do you do with the problems is the question, right? Uh, this is um, this is really, you know, and, and how did those problems arise to begin with? Um, so so again, this this question of compliance is it's very useful to know. Um, but, you know, it's like saying, um, you know, if we put speed camera trap, if we put speed cameras up, will it catch more people speeding? Well, yes, but you know, uh, the 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 origin of the speeding is the person you know behind the car dr driving, and and uh, and so the if the behavior changes, then maybe you know the monitoring um, may not may not become necessary in the same way. Uh, I think AI is getting more and more sophisticated. And the more that we can train it into identifying false positives, the more useful it can be. I think there's many tools that are overly verbose and they can be imposing for end users, especially trying to get into things. And that's um, a really valuable um, you know, endeavor. We, we can't expect uh, expertise out of the gate and the entry point into addressing accessibility issues. Uh, the on-ramp needs to be smooth. And uh, I think AI can really help assist people in in navigating and understanding you know the root causes of things or potentially like how to go about
fixing things. And it can get more intelligent once it connects the origin as well of um, how that HTML and JavaScript and CSS was produced. A lot of scanning tools are agnostic as to the platforms that they um, they came from. And uh, it, makes, it makes it a little bit hard for potentially a content uh, person to go back and speak to the, a developer in a way that's um, giving them some like pointers about where where maybe to look or where things may originate from. So there's definitely opportunity there, um, but it's you know it's still going to take some work. Um, and speed uh, the speed of AI processing is also you know getting you know more and more impressive, and and that can be um, that can be a huge uh, you know boon to um, you know, more more sophisticated scrolling scroll uh, crawling. But you know, a hundred percent reaching a hundred percent. Again, I don't think we should stay focused on on the score so much as uh, the goals and uh, and and um, and usability. Uh, if we do that, you know, the scores will will take care of themselves. Uh, again, WCAG is a series of guidelines, uh, and uh, they're guidelines deliberately, you know, for a reason because we all understand that sometimes. Um, you know, there may be certain sets of conditions that create exceptions, uh, you know, to, to rules. Yeah, I mean, I think it's almost like if we wanted to be able to say, well, automated tests can, you know, increase that percentage from 30% to 85%, right? We would have to train, we'd have to train AI if AI were going through and doing that to understand and be able to interpret a website like a user does which is very different from, you know, just following literal HTML rules and checking against them, right? So mm -hmm. if I encounter yeah. this thing, my next step would be to do why, right? And I think until we do get AI to do that, it's hard to imagine removing a human from the testing process. Um, so, we, oh, I was just going to say, we have three different questions about alt text and mm -hmm. what you should write for alt text and guidelines. Um, I think we have some some tools. I don't know what they're off the top of my head that we, we send to some content editors and stuff about doing alt text. Uh, but just I'd say our my personal recommendation is to think about why you're adding the image to the page. Um, I know that you know people are asking about like screenshots and what do you describe? And really it's, you know, I guess, you know, in your in your when you learn to write in middle school, they're like, you know, write a newspaper article and it's like the most write the most important thing to the least important thing. And the same thing works with alt text is like think about what the most important thing that's most important takeaway it is when someone actually looks at an image and then perhaps some additional details. Um, you know, rather than trying to describe everything, I would say, mm -hmm. you know, context is important. Like, you know, Andrew had that uh, image of Steve Jobs giving a presentation and you know, it might be important if it's an article about the history of Steve Jobs, like, you know, d delivering something like this is the first time Steve Jobs showed this computer, what it was like that. Whereas if it's an article about how Steve Jobs, like, you know, got himself killed by not, you know, getting cancer treatment, uh, you wouldn't really care what computer he's holding. Um, yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, I think so a follow up question on that, maybe you can share your thoughts. So FJ had asked specifically about using colors, mm -hmm. vantage point, texture. And FJ said, my thinking is that such descriptions might be meaningless to a blind or low vision or colorblind person, although a colorblind person is probably not engaging with all text. Um, and so yes. they're wondering, are they overthinking the issue? Do you have some thoughts on that about describing color in alt? Um, yes specifically because I've seen some people who were visually impaired actually answer this question. Um, and they, you know, obviously, even if someone is like a, a significant number of people who are blind were not always blind and <laughs> remember what colors are. So obviously it helps them to, to visualize it uh, if they were previously sighted. But uh, then, yeah, I, I, I saw someone answer the question who's been blind from birth and uh, basically just describing how they understand color and they have a nuanced understanding of color as a concept and you know what color means um we, so yes include color i don't think anyone minds it um i don't think you're wasting anyone's time i think i think it's helpful for everyone 
That's a matter of equity as well, right? If everyone understands they're wearing a blue sweater, but then someone who's blind does not, and then later, you know, th there's a reference to a blue sweater, then they're sort of lost. So it's important to create mm -hmm. that um, that kind of context. At the same time, you don't want to have yeah. to describe everything on the off chance that yeah. someone mentions it. Like, you know, Andrew has a very, very nice uh, orange sweater on that we haven't mentioned. It has kind of an asymmetrical collar and looks very chic. Um, <laughs> but maybe it's not relevant to your understanding maybe not of relevant him as a presenter in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Right. <laughs> Look at those buttons. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So on, on the art, on the alt text topic, Mark was following up on your comment that you had suggested perhaps requiring alternative text mm -hmm. in the CMS. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mark said, I'm sure you know that requiring alt text can lead to people including unnecessary alt text for decorative images, such as icons or yep. putting bad alt text in to avoid the requirement. Um, he says he's seen quote image before with a sad face mm -hmm. emoji uh yeah. do you just feel like it's better than missing alternative text or do you add a checkbox that people can check to indicate that it's decorative how how do you approach that if you're going to require alternative text yeah my recommendation was specifically for content images and content editors so images within the main body of the the text and if yeah, I mean, that does it, get a little dicey yeah. in WordPress, though, because if okay. you're using the yeah. block editor, nowadays, yeah. the direction WordPress is going is everything <laughs> is mm -hmm. in the content editor, yeah. right? And so yeah. there would be a lot of icons or even background images mm -hmm. that are added that don't really provide any visual importance, but are decorative. It's about kind of structuring that content and the the in in the block structures, um, you know, where where those um uh, where that material is is going to be used, uh, requiring something uh, again, this comes down to content governance and education. Requiring or not requiring it, you can get terrible alt text. Mm -hmm. So the the act of requiring it kind of prompts um, is a is a is an opportunity for education and uh, and and reinforcement of a policy. Um, it's a broader governance question as to how to get the quality of that alt text improved and uh, simply requiring it as people are going about things really quickly uh, can be just sort of help. It's helpful for, from a governance perspective, not so much from a compliance perspective. Right. Uh, but yes, the, mm -hmm. the decorative nature um, there are other ways of including decorative images and starting to consider those uh, helps to build a more semantic website and it helps to treat those, um, you know, differently from a, a programmatic perspective. A lot of what we um, value in content management systems is that, and in websites in general, is a separation between, you know, presentation and content. Uh, that's kind of come a bit full circle again with more live editing features. And so we do need to think mindfully about um, how we're approaching uh, those uh, the, those matters um, for sure. And it's it's something we're we're working through as well to help improve the editor experience. Um, one, and how we're we're doing block block editing here. Yeah, uh, one thing about decorative images also, <laughs> it's it's important to realize that n not it's, it's being visually impaired isn't a binary. There's lots of people who can't see very well, and there are some tools that let people mouse over items to see what they are. Uh, so even if your image is decorative, people might still be trying to access the alt text to see if it is important or not. So usually it is helpful to have alt text just, or if an image doesn't load and people don't know what it is, uh, it usually is helpful to have the alt text there. So I would say, um, yeah, in include alt text whenever possible and structure your page in a way that images aren't too obtrusive. Uh, one great example is cards. Like you got your little your little teaser card for a, a blog post or something like that. And usually the image is on top. And one of the few times that we break the recommendation of, you know, there is the recommendation that the content on the page should be the same as the content in the DOM. So screen reader users can see things in the right order. The one time that I don't do that is for images and cards. Um, so when screen users end up on a card, they see the heading first, the text, and then it reads the image description afterwards. Um, so if you can, if images are kind of descriptive, but they might be important, uh, just, you know, have them read out to screen readers, screen readers, reader users after, um, you know, the, the heading. 
mm -hmm. to de-emphasize yeah. them. I think the the last question about alt text was um, Gary had asked if the necessary alt text is too long. It says for the two to three sentence guideline, where would you provide that longer description? Do you use a long descript field or uh, linked text on the website or put it below an infographic like C text equivalent? Um, and he's specifically referencing infographics. Yeah. Infographics are tricky, like putting that in the long description uh, is is not as... Um, There's not full browser like support for that, is there? And it's long not as great an ex experience. Like, I think from an equity perspective too, like other users may be interested in what the alternative experience is, right? And so providing an alternative experience, um, we've seen this before, you have like a lot of co uh, complex data and then it's like, see a more accessible experience. And like, I was really interested in that because they showed, oh, well actually, you know what, here's users, these other users are getting a really small subset of the data of the, and so this is what their experience is. And then I can understand better how to, you know, communicate with users that are having that experience. Whereas if it's kind of buried in that longer description, uh, it can be less, uh, less accessible, you know, to everyone. And, um, and sometimes people are curious in the same way that they like to look at captions on video, uh, an alternative experience to something that's interactive. Um, again, if you're, you know, in a situation that is, um, uh, you know, like maybe you're in a moving vehicle, right? And like, and <laughs> it's kind of easier to, you know, you can do the thing and maybe you get the, 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 the browser to read you the stuff and people uh, use different modalities for accessing information. So we try not to use too much of the long description uh, if possible and provide a, a, a different experience. Yeah, I think a, a good solution for an infographic is have very short alt text that literally says infographic described below <laughs> and write, have a written description mm -hmm. on the page. If you don't, if for some reason you don't want it to be visual text in, in the article, you could even put it in a keyboard accessible accordion, right? So that it can open and yeah. close below the image. But honestly, if you think about SEO and all that, and a lot of people yeah. create infographics because they want yeah, people yeah. to share them and they want them to be found in search, having a mm -hmm. full written explanation of everything that's visualized in the infographic is only going to help you for making it available to everyone, I think, and not just people who are blind. Um, yeah. Switching topics a little bit, Maureen uh, is asking about um, many themes of the H1 page title to be hidden. The H1 page title is displayed in the site tab and not on the page. Can screen readers see the H1? I'm not sure about the implementation details of it, um, but you know there are ways to visually hide text. So obviously, just you know inspect the element and see how it's being hidden. Uh, if it's a dis if you know someone puts display none in the CSS, obviously screen readers can't or visibly hidden screen readers usually can't. Um, unfortunately, there is no display visually hidden. Uh, you know property in CSS. I feel like that is one of the gigantically, you know, oversighted parts of CSS is not being able to set something to visually hidden. So we have like a little snippet uh, that we use that basically shrinks the element down to a pixel and hides the text and stuff like that uh, and leaving it available to screen readers. But yeah, it really depends on the implementation. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a really handy browser extension that I use called Headings Map. I don't know if you all use that in your practice, but I would say if you have a WordPress theme where you've turned off your heading or set it to be hidden, I just go to the front end of that page and you can use the Headings Map tool. And what it does is it outlines all the headings and it will tell you if the H1 is still on the page or not. Because <laughs> sometimes that results in it's literally not on the page. Um, other times people are, have it set and it's just screen reader text. So probably depends on the, the theme there. So, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say someone just asked about dropdowns being a nightmare for screen reader users. Yeah, I mean, like like I said, like site navigation is at least half of the work in, in developing a, a, a theme. Um, it really depends on the number of items in the dropdowns. If you have like a heading with maybe two or three items under some of the items, it usually is fine when you're tabbing through it to tab down into the dropdowns. Um, you know, that's for screen reader users and uh, keyboard users. If they're 
every item in a menu has a bunch of items below it. You don't want to have to tab or navigate through them all. So we do recommend having those hidden by disclosure element like details. Um, you know, where people, when you get to a section, you actually have to toggle open uh, the, the, the menu on keyboard. So then you can actually not go through all those items if you don't want to. Yeah, there's a, I'll put a link in the chat. There's a meetup recording that was all about navigation and how to handle those drop downs with separate buttons and stuff. Cause I'm sure it would take a whole hour just to talk about that right now. <laughs> yeah, very complicated. So, um, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I can send these questions to you also, if you all want to write them out. We just have our captioner until 15. 15 minutes after we're supposed to end as our buffer. So, um, but the Marsha had asked, is there a list of personas available for heuristic analysis? Maybe that's a quick one that you could answer kind of lightning round style. Yes. Uh, no, uh, is, is the short answer. Uh, when we're doing a heuristic analysis, we're tending to just look at the page and see what things are broken or not. Um, you know, the, the we're sort of having experts test it. It's not the same as user testing. With user test, with user testing, it's more important to to think about the specific journey your user would take. Uh, when we're doing heuristic analysis, we're more looking at a heuristic. You know, what's on the page, what's accessible, and basically try to click on everything and try to go everywhere and see where things break. But the from the usability group? perspective, oh, um, you know the you know, as, as we're trying to build empathy for the user as well, right? So the, the personas and the user types, the user types and goals that we talked about earlier in the discovery phase, those have already been defined. And so the team that's approaching it are bringing those, you know, with them. And that's going to vary, you know, project by project uh, what those different user types, you know, are. But I would say, yeah, with, with, with heuristic analysis, basically everything mm -hmm. on the page should be accessible. <laughs> So the goal is to find anything on the page that isn't accessible because everything on the site, everything, every feature put in the site should be accessible. Um, so there really, you know, yeah, you know, needs to be a focus on everything. This is this is the answer. Um, let's see, one more. Maybe we try and get through these fast. Let's see. Um, Lelani asked, what is the criteria for legal action when everyone agrees that accessibility is a process? Where is the line drawn between in progress and unwillingness to comply? And I know you're not attorney, so maybe you have no comment on this, but I figured I'd pose it just in case you have thoughts. I think it depends on the perspective if it's internal or external, you know, where is that line trying to be drawn if we're trying to bring internal pressure or external pressure? Um, yeah, I think it's um, like to understand the question a, a little bit, a little bit better. But if internally, you know, people agree there's a priority and no one does anything about them, like how do you motivate that change internally is a different matter than if you're external and saying, hey, will you guys make your website accessible? And they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't do anything about it. Um, then when, you know, what do you do, right? How do you, how do you file with the DOJ? They're, they did put a moratorium for a little while on, uh, I don't know if that's been, been lifted on, on some things. Cause there were, um, you know, people ab abu abusing, uh, the system a little bit. Um, but, um, but I think it's a, it's a matter of, of individual conviction ultimately, and how much you're willing to like put into pursuing things like like anything else that's sort of wrong, wrong out there. Well, I think I think I think we're lucky. We tend to have a lot of nonprofit clients, a lot of people who care about mm -hmm. the world, and um, you know they're into accessibility because they want to make their sites more accessible, not because there's any yeah. sort of legal action. So, yeah. so maybe yeah. we're speaking from a place of privilege because we have good mm -hmm. clients who want to do good in the world. Um, but yeah, we're not lawyers. Yeah, um, the, um, the carrot and, is always preferred with these matters, and then uh, occasionally, you know maybe a carrot stick and then a stick, but, um, <laughs> but yeah. And on a related note, uh, John Homs asked if, if it seems like some website builder and sites are better than others in maximizing accessibility and how to work with, uh, with people who, and, and, and the answer to that is find people who find people to build your site who actually uh, care about accessibility. And if that you're working with someone who's building your site, who, um, who doesn't care about accessibility and you're having trouble getting them to build an accessible website, uh, you know, please give us a call. We're always looking for, for additional clients. Yeah, and I think too, like the question on tools, I think the reality in all of these, you know, like you were talking about during your presentation is there are some JavaScript libraries that are just not accessible. 
And so at some point, I think you have to examine the tools that Mm. you're using to build your website and decide to Mm. abandon and go to a different alternative, especially Mm -hmm. if the developer behind that tool is not interested or willing to make the fixes necessary. Yes, sure. Absolutely. We've, we've recently had to stop using several, several Drupal modules because the maintainers have been not only about accessibility, but in generally recalcitrant about, you know, being, being accountable to the, to the larger community. Mm -hmm. And so our last question then was ending on AI. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about whether or not we could get fewer false positives. Do you feel like, uh, Copilot, which I think is referring to chat GPT or an open AI, um, is cool. helping engineers. Be I've heard accurate? the opposite. Yeah. I've heard the opposite that there it is skimping on accessibility concerns and, you know, generating components with, uh, with less, uh, con- less, um, attention to that. I, I would, I would say, I would say that, you know, AI tools are trained on all the stuff that is out there. Um, so it's very good at giving you the average mm-hmm. way to do things. And so that if you're, if you're less, less good than average at doing things, AI can really help you. But if you're like, you know, AI will probably give you an average solution to a thing that with an average amount of accessibility and the average isn't great out there in terms of accessibility, like the average website isn't very excessive. So if a tool gives you the common answer, what people are mostly using, that's not actually what you want because you actually want something that's that's more accessible than the average website. So um, yeah, you can't really rely on those AI tools. At least not yet. Well, at least not yet. Th- thank you both so much. This has been a phenomenal presentation. Thanks. I appreciate you staying long to address all of the questions. How can people get a hold of you um, if you want to share Kalamuna's website again, or if either of you are on social media and there's a primary place if someone wants to follow up? Sure. Uh, I'll share my screen again. And uh, it's got some uh, connections. You can visit us at calamuna.com. Uh, there's a contact form there. You can email us at info at calamuna.com. Uh, we're on uh, Twitter now X or LinkedIn, Calamuna. We are, we are Google now Calamuna. On, we're everywhere. We are now on Mastodon, Mastodon as, as, well. as Calamuna at Mastodon.social. Yep. We need to yeah, yeah. update the slide to remove the X site. Yes, we do. <laughs> yep. I'm we'll still using the bird it. icon. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, both of you. I'm going to sit for a second because I got to make sure our transcript gets fully updated with everything. So this is the awkward part where we just smile and wave at the end and then I will end it. Bye.